Thank you, Helen, and good morning, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to be presenting some work uh, that's part of our Exploring for the Future initiative, and this is an Australian government initiative, and it's got a real focus on Northern Australia, and in particular, boosting resource exploration in Northern Australia. So as part of that initiative, there's a lot of new data being collected, including, as Phil showed you before in his talk, new geochemical data, but also things like AUSAEM-1 is part of that, new ground gravity stations, and even a stratigraphic drilling program. But what I'm going to show you today is a bit different to that in the fact that it's using existing and freely available geophysical data sets, and namely that's our gravity and magnetic data coverage across Australia. So on that note, the aim of this study is to predict the presence of hydrothermal alteration systems associated with iron oxide copper gold deposits. And there's two bits of information we're using to really target those hydrothermal alteration systems. And the first is that we're expecting the host rocks in the vicinity of an ICG to display hydrothermal alteration along a spectrum in which we're going to see magnetite and hematite. And in addition to that, we're also expecting to see contact zones between magnetite and hematite rich alteration as being highly favourable for the formation of higher grade copper gold mineralisation. So in tackling this problem of looking for a hydrothermal alteration system, we want to understand the distribution of magnetite and hematite in the subsurface and their spatial relationship to one another. And so we're very much looking at the regional scale. We're not interested in particular in defining an ore deposit. We're looking at the footprints of that deposit. We're looking at the indicators that there is a deposit in that region. So one of the methods we've adopted in trying to tackle this problem is the alteration cone theory. And this theory is based on the fact that uh, a rock's mineralogy is, what, mineralogy is what largely controls its physical properties. Not entirely, but largely controls its physical properties. So in this case, uh, in the diagram there, you can see two physical properties, magnetic susceptibility versus density. And we have some sort of theoretical unaltered host rock shown in gray, and two cones varying towards hematite and another to magnetite. And those are showing you those alteration cones where you're expecting if your unaltered host rock does undergo some sort of hydrothermal alteration, those physical properties within the rock will start trending towards either magnetite or hematite. So the challenge here is to define those alteration cones. And so what techniques do we have to investigate these sort of subsurface properties? We're interested in magnetic susceptibility and density. So in Australia, we're very blessed to have regional coverage of freely available gravity and magnetic data sets. And so in this case, we can take our magnetic intensity data, for example, and through 3D inversion, turn that into a 3D model of magnetic susceptibility. In the same, same way, we can take our gravity data and through 3D inversion, turn that into a 3D model of density. And in this case, we're using the University of British Columbia's geophysical inversion codes, their MAG3D and Grav3D version five. If you're interested in the details of how the data misfit for these are achieved, how the model objective function works and all that sort of thing, they're available there in Lee and Oldenburg 96 and 98. But I won't go into those in any detail today. So it's also important to point out that this is not necessarily a new technique. This has been used in previous studies, particularly in the Olympic Dam region and also in the Cobar region in New South Wales. And the image on the right there shows you the project area for the Cobar region study as an example. So if you are interested in this technique, it has been applied before in slightly different ways in a number of other studies. But I guess what makes this study different is first of all the location. So we're looking at Northern Australia, we're looking at our Tennant Creek, Mount Isa region, and that's shown with the red box there. And we've built an inversion model around that shown with the black boxes. So first of all, we're looking in an area where this technique hasn't been applied before. And we're also doing this on a much, much larger scale, very much regional scale. And we're using a supercomputer facility to undertake these 3D inversions. So that's showing you that same area there. The core volume 
in that diagram shows you the area we're interested in. That's the area we want to interrogate in our 3D inversion models. Outside of that, we have a data volume. That's the extent of the data we need to do this type of inversion. And beyond that, again, we have a padding volume. And that defines a bunch of cells on the edge of our model, which we essentially discard at the end. But they're there to remove any edge effects in our 3D model. So the core volume there is 830 by 670 kilometers horizontally and 70 kilometers depth. And in order to accommodate this size inversion, we need two by two kilometer cells horizontally. And that is a compromise. We're using that uh, to run our inversions on the National Computational Infrastructure. That's a supercomputer facility at the ANU in Canberra. And that cell size uh, was chosen so that our models would run within six hours using 128 computer processors. So it is an iterative approach. We run multiple models, and the idea is that we could run those within a reasonable time and interrogate them and improve them as we go. And so just a note on the cell size there, this, that cell size means that we need to upward continue our data to two kilometers. So we are removing short wavelength information from our data. That's not necessarily a bad thing, and I will go into the resolution a bit more later, uh, but in that case, um, it's just important to note the resolution of these models on such a large scale. We end up with a model that has 12.7 million cells. And just on here as well, the method there, we're using the UBC inversion method and we're, doing, we're creating coincident models. So we're creating a separate magnetic susceptibility and a separate density model, but each one of those models has a coincident <coughs> cell. So we can interrogate each of those for both of those properties. The models are constrained. We have a very, I guess, generalized geological model to help us constrain some important features that we want to, I guess, uh, not include in our interpretation. We don't want that to influence the inversion result as such within our area of interest at least. So we've built a, a very large geological model for our gravity Inversion at least, we have a base layer there defined by OSMOHO 2015, that's our MOHO layer. And for our magnetic inversion, we have a Curie depth. So anything that sits below the Curie depth will not be magnetic. On top of that, we have a crustal volume, and this is our area of interest. This is the layer that we want to interrogate for those physical properties. This is what we want to learn more about, and we've got very loose constraints on this to allow the inversion to define for us where it thinks those dense and magnetically susceptible bodies will exist. But we don't want to include the effects of sedimentary basins. So we've used sea base for Proterozoic and Phanerozoic sediments, and that's to allow us to lock in a layer in the near surface, which is low density, low magnetically susceptible. We're interested in the features that lie below these sedimentary basins. And of course, we have a layer there for water. And on, out, on the outside of that, as I mentioned before, we have some padding cells, and these allow us to remove any influences from edge effects on the side of the model. So I'm not going to go through the parameters and the details of how the inversions are set up themselves. I'm just going to show you some of the results of that coincident inversion. So this is our area of interest here. And these are just some slices through our magnetically sus magnetic susceptibility model. And what you can see there is that there's a near surface layer. I don't know if I have a pointer. No, I don't. But there's a near surface layer there which shows you in blue a sharp contrast between the, that crustal volume in the middle of that slice. There's a sharp contact there. That's because we've put that into our model as a hard constraint. And so you see a sharp contact on that boundary. The same again, the blue layer at the bottom is our Curie depth constraint. Those layers are non-magnetic and you have a sharp contrast with what's above and below that layer. You'll notice that in the middle there, those values are varying smoothly between blue through to hot colors. And that's just the nature of this style of inversion. You create a smooth model that vary, where the properties vary smoothly from high to low. And we can interrogate these models in different ways. Essentially, these models individually are going to tell us something about the volume of magnetically susceptible material and the trend of the geology. And again, we can do the same thing for our density model. You'll notice again, there's that, that hard near surface constraint and a hard 
uh, constraint for where we've put in a Moho layer. And the properties in between those are varying smoothly. And again, we can interrogate these models in various different ways. But the real power of doing these two coincident models is to interrogate them together. And so what we've got here is a cross plot of magnetic susceptibility versus density. And each one of those blue dots shows you a cell from the inversion model results for both density and magnetically susceptible material. So the challenge here is then to define within this population a group of those cells which you would consider to be our unaltered host rock. And then on top of that, define zones which are proxies for our magnetite and hematite alteration. Now this is very subjective and you might define some different cells to this. And in fact, I'll show you some examples where I've changed the cutoffs for these to make these populations even more extreme from each other. You'll notice that the, the cells there don't tend to form into clusters. There's no distinct population of cells there. They seem to trend away from each other in certain areas, but there's no distinct clusters of those cells. And again, that's the nature of this style of 3D inversion. Those cells are varying smoothly from one to another. But still, we're able to define distinct properties based on how dense they are and how magnetically susceptible they are. So our mag magnetite proxy is simply the densest and most magnetic cells in this model. Our hematite proxy is also the dense portion, but less magnetically susceptible. So what do the results look like? This is our 3D model volume. And shown in gray this time is the hematite alteration proxy and shown in pink is the magnetite alteration proxy. And just given the, uh, I guess the scale of this model, it's a bit easier to show these just as a, a map view top down. So I'm just gonna show you, yes, just in a 2D map view, it's a bit easier to explain some of these anomalies. So again, we've got our magnetite proxies here and our hematite prox magnetite proxies in red, our hematite proxies in blue. And this is those same 3D volumes, but we just projected them onto a 2D surface to help us understand them a bit better. And you'll notice there's a lot of interesting trends there. Some of those follow the Mount Isa belt, the, uh, a few inliers there, and there's a few more discrete anomalies where we have this red and blue lining up next to each other. So I'm going to look at... Well, first of all, we'll talk about the cutoffs. So we've, this, these cutoffs here show you for magnetite, really high density, really high magnetically susceptible material, and hematite, dense but less magnetically susceptible. And we can change those cutoffs and make those two populations even more extreme from one another. If you think that is too generous, you can cut them down, and we can keep doing this until you essentially end up with very discrete bodies, very anomalous portions of the model, and see how they relate to one another. So this is Again, I'll say a subjective process and how you define those clusters really requires, I guess, some extra input, geological constraints and so on. But I'm going to show you one particular area of interest, which comes from the area around Mount Isa. So shown with brown, those are some of the major roads. Shown in blue, uh, operating mines in the area. And what was very encouraging to find with this study is that we have three deposits there, Ernest Henry, Mount Margaret, and Monokoff, which all lie within one of these magnetite alteration proxy zones. In the case of Ernest Henry and Mount Margaret, they also lie directly adjacent to those blue cells, which are the hematite alteration proxy. And this was a very encouraging result. Unfortunately, Eloise falls just outside the model area, and I can't really say much about that one. But Again, we can take these cutoffs, we can make them a bit more extreme, see if they still have any association with our proxies. And again, they do. Ernest Henry, Mount Margaret, Monokoff, they all lie within one of these magnetite alteration proxy zones. And interestingly, Ernest Henry, even with that extreme cutoff, still lies directly adjacent to one of those hematite alteration proxies. There are a number of other operating mines in the area which do not have an association with these models, but we wouldn't expect them to in this case. We're not looking for that type of alteration system. Interestingly, interestingly though, Mount Cuthbert does lie within one of those hematite alteration proxies. So that was a very encouraging result for our, our regional scale, relatively coarse model. I'll also show you another example from the East Tennant region. This lies within 
the Northern Territory, just east of Tennant Creek. And this has become an area of interest and has resulted in a lot, lot more uh, study within Geoscience Australia. So there's, there's new data being acquired here. And it was deemed necessary to rerun these models just within this East Tennant area at a high resolution. And so this is, I guess, a really good example of comparing uh, our, our regional SOW, very coarse model, with a, a slightly higher resolution model. So sh what's shown here is just a zoom in of that previous zone. It's the two kilometre cell size area. And if I just fade it to grey and overlay on the top our new high resolution model, this time with 800 by 800 metre cells horizontally, you'll see there's, there's quite a drastic change in the amount of information you get out of these models. Those robust features remain. I think you'll agree that the, the general robust features in this model will remain. We're not comparing exactly like with like here, but it's interesting to see that the high resolution model picks out much more finer detail. There's a lot more of those smaller cells, which are probably of interest for this particular type of study. Now, what we also have in this area is a lot of legacy drill hole information. And one that's of particular interest is this borehole DDH5. And in this case, this is of interest because it lies directly on top of one of these areas we've, we've picked as having both magnetite and hematite alteration proxies lying on top of each other. So here's some slides here, courtesy of James Murr from Geoscience Australia. These are uh, not my own, and I'm going to explain them in very simple terms. It's very complicated geology that's uh, definitely beyond me, but within this borehole we have an upper, middle and lower section, generally speaking, and in that middle section we have an iron-rich laminated metasedimentary sequence. So what some of the geoscientists at GEO put together is a paragenesis for this particular portion of the hole, that middle section, and the parts that are of interest are stage one of this paragenesis, which shows the regression and and or hydrothermal alteration and magnetite replacement of protolithic hematite. Stage two, uh, actually that's a thin section there as well, showing hematite altered magnetite with relic magnetite. Stage two then shows further deformation and hydrothermal veining and alteration which includes hematite. As a thin section there again, showing some some uh, more detail towards the hematite. But the point here is that those stages, stages one and two, they are strong evidence that a hydrothermal system, an ICG related hydrothermal system is operating in this area. And again, this is a very encouraging result. This is a, within a zone that we would have picked for this type of alteration. And we see evidence here that uh, this is likely to exist here. So again, that, that, that's very encouraging. We have a good example there of, I guess, these models doing what we were hoping they would do. And so just as a, a final thought on this East Tennant region, we're looking at these two zones, their spatial relationship to one another, and we've identified at the start that the contact zones between them are highly favourable for higher grade copper gold mineralisation. So another way we can display these is just their proximity to one another. Blue showing you ones, those bodies that lie in isolation, grading up to those hotter colours where they lie directly adjacent to one another. And that would, for me, be areas to go and do further research and see just how well these models actually hold up. So just on those models, it's important to understand their limits and their uncertainty as how you get the most out of actually using them and interpreting them correctly. We've already spoken a bit about the resolution of the models and how that changes the shape and distribution of features. But what these also really require is more prior geological knowledge. We need more information that goes into those reference models. And we have some of that information now. We can put in, for example, the South Nicholson Deep Seismic Reflection Survey as a constraint into those sedimentary basins. We can also include some more near surface information from airborne EM and even solid geology, particularly uh, in this case because we're dealing largely in areas that are undercover. Now those uh, proxies that we've chosen are likely to overlap with unaltered 
geological units and also other types of alteration minerals. There's no doubt about that. And that also ties back to that last point where you need more prior geological information to help govern where you determine those proxies exist and what population of cells they relate to. And finally, remnant magnetization is always a problem when you're dealing with magnetic data. And so two techniques there to try and combat that are simply to look at the analytical signal for that magnetic data set. And because in the case of 3D inversion, you will get false anomalies. Those proxies will appear where they do not exist in reality. And so you need to have a look at the analytical signal as a first pass, or even try a completely different style of inversion technique. And there's one there called the magnetic vector inversion, which deals quite well with remnant magnetization bodies. And so just to, as a final slide, uh, this has been released as a Geoscience Australia record. You can find it there, it's 2019-03. And this also includes digital attachments. So you can have a look at uh, those images I've shown you there as 2D rasters. And you can also take the 3D models, both the inversion models, their inputs, and the proxies that have been made from those models. And you can in inter interrogate them yourself in 3D. You can define your own alteration proxies. Um, they're available there freely to use. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, James. Do we have any questions? Rick. Um, it's, it's, um, I really like this stuff. I mean, lots and lots and lots of 